Uh, it's been about 10 weeks since we were last here. Um, I'm Mike Dingledine, lead architect with SHP Leading Design. Um, we've reached, uh, and not to you yet, but to the OSFC, we've reached a milestone deliverable, and that's the schematic design. And we are submitting that tomorrow morning, and we wanted to show you uh, some of the things we're submitting. Schematic design is a milestone, but it's not a, a, a completion point. It is a point at which we would like to think programmatically, uh, spatially, massing-wise, we're in a place where we can submit and, and express our intent to OSFC. And so that's what we're here to do. Um, I'm going to go back just really quickly to some of the things I presented the last time I was here in, in late June just to sort of bring that context forward into the, um, the information we're going to share with you tonight. Um, we held exterior design style meetings um, with the community and they had some interesting results. We, we typically do this in every school district. We take about nine different styles from a very traditional to a very contemporary and kind of some in-betweens. And we, we weigh two things. Uh, one thing is just personal opinion of a style. Uh, and then we weigh something very important that's different. We weigh um, what they think would fit best in their community. And when you see movement in those kinds of questions, you, you have impact. We had a pretty good response to traditional Ivy League campus. People like this look. Uh, we had, a, you can see, increasing strength that's the most positive, most appealing. The most interesting movement, though, came here is that when we thought about how well it fit community, it flipped. And individually, uh, individuals thought when they think about their community and the styles that fit in their community, this was not appropriate. Um, and so there's, that point of movement is a strong indicator. Uh, on the other hand, we talked about traditional materials, brick and stone and glass, and the things that make buildings look traditional and solid, but making them slightly more contemporary with the uh, things like the entry and the sort of transparency that comes with the large curtain wall at entrances. And we got, uh, again, some surprising results. Pretty strong appeal all the way across the board. Very few people found it not appealing. But what was most important is when we thought about how well it fit in the community, it went very positive. 90% were in six or seven. And so that is a strong element to us. That clearly is a direction uh, that we have followed and want to continue to. So as you look at those kind of buildings, again, these are the kinds of uh, things we thought about as we thought about the way to treat the programmatic and massing of the buildings as, as we've gotten to at this point in schematic design. Uh, we also did some best practices review by touring buildings with teachers and, and, and parents and, and just people interested in the district. We, we toured all kinds of schools around this area, have continued that sort of informally even as far south as Hamilton, my hometown, um, had Bill and Mark down to look at some of the Hamilton schools. And a lot of the best practice examples that we received from this district were their, your own examples. Uh, the extreme daylight in public spaces like the cafeterias at the high school. Uh, this is an example of using a cafeteria for a performance space at an elementary level. Uh, got a lot of strong support for that kind of concept. Another example of that. Again, notice the amount of daylight that is in, uh, brought into these kind of spaces. Uh, mix, connecting the gym and the cafeteria into one large space for after hours events. Again, got strong support. It's a pretty common thing among school districts that build medium to small elementaries. Uh, this is a great way to take your two largest spaces and make one large space out of it. The gyms are characteristically large under OSFC programs, and so we talked about how to make those do the things we want them to do, including dividing them in half for, for multiple classes. Um, having vertical circulation connections that are visible and supervisable and part of the main entry of the building, uh, something that we did not do at the intermediate schools but got some support in this time around. Transparency was a big theme, uh, being able to see what's going on and having uh, supervision happen uh, in very passive ways and not so much in active ways. Not so much buzzing doors and having cameras, but having uh, a natural flow of traffic that comes into the office and then moves out into the building. Um, larger uh, assets that come with OSFC programming like clinics. Um, media centers still getting importance, although books are becoming less of the dominant feature of the media center, all not going away at all. Uh, but technology and open workspace and reading space have become a pretty large effort, and you can see that example in this picture. Uh, music and art rooms that are designed to purpose. They're not repurposed classrooms. They're very different, and they have different co components of lighting and technology uh, that support, and furniture, obviously, that support those activities. Uh, extended learning areas, something uh, a bit new um, statewide, uh, certainly pioneered well here in our intermediate schools, the room between the rooms, but this is also what we call sort of the larger group ELA, uh, that sort of lobby space that occurs in a suite of classrooms that gives all kinds of opportunities for small and large group work. Uh, something that we saw in many schools, including Hamilton, uh, that have been surprisingly um, embraced by teachers uh, and, and used in ways that we didn't even think of, um, and surprisingly not left uh, empty or left unused, but teachers are continuing to find new and better ways uh, to, to find teaching and learning activities that take place outside of the large, flexible classroom. 
um, and this is an example of the, the kind of spaces we pioneer here, the space between the rooms where you have private one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one kind of an approach to um, having also visual connection to the classroom and supervisory ability to even have students use these rooms on their own. Lots of high uh, natural light in classrooms is a recent phenomenon uh, in terms of how much we've learned about how daylight impacts education. And so we are definitely looking at a lot of ways to use natural light and artificial light in ways that work well together. Uh, and you can see the scale of that and how it impacts the higher ceilings in classrooms is, is makes for a very nice environment. Um, our classroom wings, are, we're careful to uh, have actually done a little bit of online surveying with your district in terms of how to balance the educational space. You basically get a certain amount of programming in the OSFC manual that you can use toward classrooms. If you want to augment that square footage with those small learning areas like we had at the intermediates and this larger sort of shared ELA space, you have to do that by balancing the square footage in the academic model. So we showed a couple examples of how to do that in different levels of balance and we came up with this as the one that re received the most support uh, from the district and it was to not exclusively do small group rooms but do small group rooms as, in, as, a high as, uh, as high as we can get toward that two to one relationship, a one between every pair of classrooms, but also not to give away the opportunities that come with that larger space. And again, using design and using building layouts uh, where the hallways are basically um, absorbed into these large spaces because there's no through traffic into other wings of the building through these areas, uh, we were able to capture a, quite a bit of space and not, uh, again, not be over our programming limit with the OSFC. So we're getting to the point where now we're looking at how furniture and equipment uh, impacts those decisions and making sure we're not uh, making anything that, that nets us in in the wrong way. So what that's turned into over the summer and the most part of our work is how do we build 13 elementary schools that have tremendous equity uh, but work on the individual sites. And so we call them site adaptations. And we, we've used this word. It's not magic and it's not sort of coined, but kit of parts means that we're looking at making design decisions that work across all 13 buildings, but do it in a way that those building pieces will adapt to any site condition. And we have lots of existing sites, which is a great value in this process that we, we know what we're working with and we have existing sites and aren't purchasing land and then finding all the things out we need to know about it. We're working with 12 of your sites, our existing school sites. And so what we've come up with, we have three models of schools, as you know, a 600 student elementary, we have seven of those, a 520, we have four of those, and two 400s are actually 399s technically to meet our numbers. And what you're seeing is a development of a kit of parts where every classroom wing in every building that's a 600 is identical. Uh, the way it joins with the core of the building has a lot to do with the orientation of the building on a site, the direction the face of the building needs to front based on road access or uh, bus drives or those kinds of things. So you'll see a lot of commonality across these seven uh, kit of parts models. And with three 600s, two 500s, and two 400s, we're able to adapt to all 13 sites. So looking at them a little closer, uh, there's actually names of schools here that are contemplated uh, that the orientation we need, for instance, at Alton Hall and Harmon is a west-facing entrance. And so we have a north-south facing classroom wing where all the windows face north and south for daylighting. We have a west facing entrance that allows us to do site circulation the way we anticipate it'll be needed on Alton, and I'll show you Alton in a minute. Uh, and we stack well with facilities on a two-story plan because the 600 student elementaries seem to work best in a two-story configuration. So there's, an, there's a prototype 600 student elementary um, based on all the original information we drew out of the district through our design phase. This is the same exact 600 student prototype elementary, but now we have a site, an example is Prairie Lincoln and Prairie Norton, where the, the frontage of the building needs to face to the south. And so now it has to be in line with the classrooms because the classrooms still need to face north and south for the right daylighting. So this is what we call a long scheme, but if you look at it compared to the scheme before, all the components there are identical. They're combined differently, a little bit different corridor layout, uh, but every room in the building is matched identically in square footage and dimensions to every room in the, in the proto original prototype. So we call it a variation. So this is the original, oops, this is the variation. And then finally, to make all of the 600s work, we even have an east-facing building where we actually just flip the entire plan, mirror image it, and again, east to west is a very different mechanical design. So this is a variation. It's not just rotating the building because we have to design differently for the orientation uh, to, the, to the heat loads in east and west. So summer styles in West Franklin fit this um, model. The 520s look very similar, but in fact, they are very different. Um, we have fewer classrooms. Uh, we have smaller rooms in most of the core spaces. 
So every room, gym, cafeteria, stage, art, music, kitchen, office area even, the reception area, they're all slightly different in a 520 model based on how the OSFC generates programming. And so while we've taken all the same thinking forward in this model, it is a totally different building from the standpoint of dimensions. Uh, but all of the things we did organizationally to make the buildings work are still carried forward in the 520. And then we also have Finland uh, a need to do a north-south orientation, and so we have a long option in the 520 as well that, again, uses all the same kit of parts to create this orientation. The 400s were interesting in that we could escape the need for a second story on the 400s. The 400s are the hardest buildings in the OSFC manual to create because they use the minimum amount of square footage, and it's um, at between 350 and 400 are basically the smallest buildings you can build under the OSFC program. And so getting rid of the stairs and getting rid of the elevator cores allowed us a little bit of flexibility in creating a plan that sits um, in a one-story configuration that allows a lot of things to happen that I was worried we would have, tr have trouble with at these small buildings. Uh, and our site space allows us to be able to use this footprint. So it's very similar in one story to what the 600 is in two story. So it's an interesting uh, combination. It looks very similar to our 600s, although you'll notice quickly a lot of differences in that vertical circulation. And then we flip that plan uh, for Darbydale and Richard, uh, and they both need opposite um, east and west orientation. So in the end, we have a plan here, a kit of parts. There are three original prototypes, 1600, 1520, and 1400. There are four variants uh, that work for every site. And so if you do the math, for 13 sites, we have three original designs, four variant designs, and six identical buildings. So the thing we knew that we liked about the intermediates, but we didn't want to struggle with the differences when we turned the orientation of the buildings, we have solved in this time around by creating this process. And again, six duplications means a very efficient uh, approach to how we're going to do design, engineering, and ultimately construction of these buildings. Um, so three originals, four variations, and six absolute copies uh, is going to get us 13 new buildings in this district. The next part of our process, which we're engaged in now, especially for our phase one sites, is looking at how those things overlay um, the sites. We have spent some time looking at all the sites and understanding which kind of site that we have, and there's four kinds. The most common is the build-move site, where we build a new building on empty space in the site near, of course, the existing building, but it allows us to stay, operate the school in the existing building the entire time we build the new site. The last three months of our construction period, ideally over the summer, we'll be tearing down the old building, creating the final site footprint, and moving into a new building. And so there's no swing space necessary, and it's a fairly efficient approach. Everything that happens, happens on site the entire time through construction and occupancy. Uh, we have three sites that are considered too tight to build a new building and, and keep the old building in place. So we have to swing those kids off that site. There's three of those sites in, in this program. Uh, and we have to find a place to swing them. And that brings us to number three. There are also, fortunately, three sites that have enough space that we can not only build the building and finish the site work, we can keep the old building in place for a phase. And that will allow our off-site swing spaces to find homes for one year in swing space buildings. Um, and so we'll have the opportunity to completely control our occupancy without any artificial swing space, any created rental trailers or any church basements or the kind of things that some districts face. We're able to do all of our occupancy on our existing sites. And we're able to sh uh, shift our phases around so that we'll build our swing sites first and then our swing off sites second and allow them to use those original buildings. And then we, of course, have one new site where we'll be building a new building and obviously bringing those kids from existing buildings. So Alton Hall is one of our commoner sites. It's a build, a build move site. There's enough space to the north of the current Alton Hall space to plop in our prototype, our west-facing student, 600-student building. Uh, it gives us a proper orientation. It gives us space between the existing building and the new building. Um, it allows us to do minimal demolition on this site in order to build our new building and fence off a construction zone. And then, ultimately, it allows us uh, to look now at what we're doing in this phase of our work, looking at how traffic flow, how drop-off lanes, how bus drop-offs separate from parents. Uh, we have a small early childhood drop-off space that's right against the, adjacent to the early childhood wing. We've taken all the features we want to see this site achieve, and we've made sure that if we build this, keep this one under, uh, under use while we build it, and then that last uh, three months, we create that final site footprint that's out of the way. And you can see it's not too bad. We have a little bit of driveway footprint to cover 
in the current Alton Hall footprint, but we'll be able to create most of the site footprint without uh, impacting Alton Hall's existence uh, for the final year of construction. So this is the process we're going to go through with every site. Uh, this is an example of how we've gotten there. So we've tested every site to understand orientation and space, but now we're actually getting into the civil engineering. We're learning about where the water and sewer and electric and all those things are and making sure we have all that figured out. And we're keeping a due diligence chart. And so far, we've had nothing but good luck and good news. We found good soil for the most part. Where we found bad soil, it's not too hard to imagine. We found every building fits the same profile for um, earthquake design. We found uh, public water where we didn't think there was any. Um, so for the most part, we're in, we've been in good shape, and we've been finding out good things about our sites. And it's making us look more and more brilliant about keeping elementary <laughs> sites. But sometimes you get in trouble for that. So now our massing studies. This is something that we're required to do for our schematic design submission. I would say this is um, as soft as it can be, but also we th like to think that the structural massing and volumetric study of the buildings is fairly close to what we'll end up with. Uh, certainly articulation is something uh, that isn't set yet. So we started with sketches. We looked at our floor plans of our long and our T buildings. Uh, we looked at uh, Mark Waller's predilection for simple roofs, no intersecting gables, make everything get run to the, the outside of the building, make the steep slope roofs work, make the low slope roofs work. We have a nice combination, I think, of very effective volumetric massing. Good news about that is it helps with the utility bills. These are pretty simple masses. Even our articulation, where we get a little bit uh, designy, uh, is done in a way that makes sure the roof forms are simple and the drainage is simple and the massing is simple. So, and we're building a, extra heavy sort of uh, thermal barriers in these buildings for our lead points, a little extra insulation in the walls and a lot of extra insulation in the roofs. So the simple roofs help us very much adapt to those uh, sustainable goals. Remember, we were looking at um, Traditional materials, so we're looking at all brick, probably two colors, a buff stone colored brick and a traditional red brick. And the combinations of where red and where buff are are certainly an ongoing study for us. Uh, but the idea that we're simplifying the exteriors with, with a primary material and not getting too crazy is, is pretty important to us. And then obviously the transparency and the sort of contemporary flair that occurs primarily at the entrances and the simple traditional look that occurs in the classroom wings is kind of the goal that comes from our feedback from the community. So again, this looks kind of finished because it's a computer rendering, but it is a study of massing at this point. And we're studying roof forms and how they come together. Uh, we're studying the entry and the volumes, and we're trying to do it in the context of things that we've heard so far uh, from the community. And so you can see the, the sort of contemporary flair of the entrance. Uh, this volume here is the reading room of the media center that kind of sticks out and creates the covering for the entrance. Uh, we like that function. Whether it stays cantilevered or has columns under it is still something, that, again, that is more functional articulation. Uh, the use of the brick and the simple forms and the masses is something that we are feeling very comfortable about. And again, the amount of total envelope volume or square footage is pretty minimal. We have pretty minimal volume wrapping around the 60 or 70,000 square feet that creates these buildings. Uh, these are the images that we use for the community feedback. So again, you can see the sort of precedent that we're following here. Traditional materials everywhere, that contemporary detailing, especially at marking the entrance and creating that transparency. Uh, these are the kind of buildings that we've looked at and created some of the takeaway. Here's the two colors of brick uh, used differently than what we're intending here. Uh, but certainly um, the massing here is very, is very much in line with the kind of massing we're going for uh, in our building. Again, the large amount of curtain wall here. A little bit of concern, energy issues, cost issues, although simple, simply done, curtain wall is not more expensive than brick walls. Uh, and we found that to be true in places where we've taken alternates on both. And here you can see again the water table out of stone color brick and the red brick and then the stone detailing that occurs gives the building the traditional flair of that material, yet still allows some of these uh, pieces to create a uh, contemporary flair in terms of the detail. Going back to the intermediates, which is a model from a lot of reasons, uh, some positive, some negative. We caught a little heat from local jurisdictions about the size of the towers and the amount of glass. Probably makes people wonder what we were thinking. Again, we were trying to make the entrances, in some cases at Park Street, way back from the, from the street, from where they used to be, uh, a scale element taller than anything else in the building. Um, as I went back and studied, we started these towers at 65 feet when we started the design. By the time we got through Grove City Zoning, we were at 55 feet uh, with the permission to, to violate the zoning height restriction of 35 by 20 feet. Uh, that's a pretty big deal, and it created a pretty tall element and a pretty large construction element in the buildings. 
and just by sake of comparisons, our new buildings um, are at 35 feet, and our classroom wings are at 40 feet. So unlike the intermediates where we had to get a variance on this height, we will not have to get a variance on our entries at the, at the, uh, at the elementary schools. We still are going to be over height on the classroom wing. 40 is about 5 feet over the 35. But frankly, that's not going to be a very difficult uh, variance given the natural ability to scale a two-story classroom wing. It's pretty much limited to the, the kind of cross-section we use at the intermediates. So when we look at the, um, the elementary school prototype, that is a 35-foot element. It's totally within height restrictions in all jurisdictions in the district. And the 40-foot classroom wing is a pretty standard cross-section, and we think that we'll be okay uh, with those variances as we've talked to the jurisdictions that have limitations. Um, right now, I think it's just Grove City that has the classroom height variation, and we're working with them directly on that. Uh, we're also looking at the volume of, of glass, and we've played around with that at sort of the, uh, the request of the folks in the district that have seen this. Uh, we do have the ability to change, kind of if you see that corner glass, uh, into adding or taking away certain amounts of masonry to fill in. Uh, these aren't cost issues. These are really just sort of construction and aesthetic issues. Uh, as I said, when you look at the simplification of curtain wall and the amount of volume we're using here under 35 feet, it's, it's not really a major cost issue. Uh, we aren't trying to replicate 55-foot towers that we did at the intermediates, but we are trying to create a very transparent and very open and well-lit entry. And certainly at night, these buildings will be a different environment, and we'll try to do some of those renderings for you before uh, we finalize ourselves through all this. Uh, but I think we're on a good track. I think certainly the massing is comfortable and efficient, uh, and the articulation is still yet um, to be massaged, I think, uh, depending on um, how all of our feedback goes from the community. I think we're at a point where we're a couple weeks away from having some more information to put out on the website in order to get some feedback on this. Uh, our next steps that are coming, um, it's tomorrow we turn into schematic design, which means tomorrow we're in design development. And what that really means is drilling down into the interior of the building in a much more detailed way. So we're going to take classroom wings and we're going to look at Furniture, finishes, casework, natural lighting, artificial lighting, power plumbing technology. A lot of what Glenn Meeks is here to do is talk about the perfect technology scenario for our future in terms of inside these rooms. That's going to play well into where we're headed with the design development. So these are going to be efforts to get inside, to drill inside these rooms and make sure all the pieces and parts work together for the future of teaching and learning. Uh, that will mean we're looking at everything from easels and loose furnishings to casework on the walls to where windows are placed to where doors are placed uh, to how the casework and the cubbies for students works. All that happens at a detailed level. We'll show elevations uh, and we'll make sure we understand what goes in what cabinet, where the paper drawer is, where the whiteboards and tack boards are, uh, even where the fire alarm and strobes are and where the phones and technology go. So all that is coordinated um, in this next effort. Even the decision to use open cubbies or closed cubbies or even a new modified locker uh, that has been successful in a couple of elementaries uh, is those kind of options we're going to be working on right now. So that's our next uh, four weeks. Mike tells me 50 days. DDs are due. That's sometime in November. <laughs> so we're not stopping, and we're moving forward, and I think the progress makes uh, hitting our summer targets much more likely. It allows our construction bids to occur in the best time of year to have those. So it may seem like we're rushing, but we're rushing for very, very good reasons, and they're, they're both financial and operational, and, and I think it's worth the effort to make sure we stay on track, but don't make a don't make a hasty decision. But I think so far we've had tremendous cooperation with, from the district, lots and lots of meetings. Patrick has set up uh, more meetings for us to t touch base with these kinds of folks. It's just a it's just a good process so far, and it's and it's gone very well. And it's obvious that the district's experience from the past uh, is helping us move quickly through our present. So that's all. I